Uh, it's a privilege to come and share with you today. It's a beautiful day here in Chesapeake, isn't it? I left home yesterday morning. It was about 29 degrees. Um, that was Fahrenheit, not Celsius. And we had snow on the ground. And uh, I go on Sunday to Wisconsin to a week of prayer. So I was looking at the weather forecast for Virginia thinking, can I get away with just cold weather gear? No, I can't. So um, I got a second set of clothing in my car at O'Hare Airport for the trip up to Wisconsin. But it's a privilege to be with you here and to share with you. And what a beautiful house of God this is, yes? Yeah, and to see it uh, full like this. And you know, as we come to the end of the pandemic and we kind of reemerge, the world is different. And to f see familiar faces again and to worship side by side, what a blessing that is. Um, you know, the, the lockdowns have been difficult for so many of us. And uh, to be able to sit side by side, to see smiles on people's faces, um, to pray with each other, it's a real blessing. So um, it's a privilege and a joy to be with you today. Now, today I have one of those um, strange experiences. Whenever I go to a church, I have about three or four sermons like ready to go. I'm never quite sure which one it's going to be. And um, I, I once stood up in a church and they read a scripture reading. I had no idea where they got it from. And then they announced a sermon. I had no idea where that was coming from either. And so it's always kind of a mystery, like, what am I going to speak about when I stand up to speak? But uh, today um, I did suggest uh, to Sister Bear, I wrote to Sister Mary Lou, uh, Mary Lou, and I thank you for your hospitality last night and tonight in advance. I was, uh, I was going to talk about David and Goliath, hence the title Overcoming the Giants. And then the Holy Spirit moved upon my heart and said, no, we need to talk about something different. So we're going to talk about something different, even though I do like the story of David and Goliath. Um, it's a great story, uh, but we're going to talk about a title. Uh, we'll, we'll leave the title there, Overcoming the Giants. Uh, but I'm going to talk about the topic of spiritual warfare uh, because we are involved in a spiritual battle. And uh, in, the, in the modern world, if you talk about these things, people think you're kind of nuts, you're kind of crazy. You need to go and see a psychiatrist. You're delusional to think about these things. And yet, um, if you believe you have a guardian angel, in fact, hands up here, who believes you have a guardian angel? All right. So you've also agreed that there are also fallen angels out there, and they're doing their best to destroy us. And so it's important that we talk about what the Bible says about this and how we can respond to it. Because our foes are not Republicans or Democrats. Our, foes, our foe is Satan himself. And it's he who can destroy your soul. He, he is the one who will um, tempt you until eventually reach the point where you end up um, an enemy of God and your eternal destiny is, is lost forever. So, uh, we're going to talk about spiritual warfare today. And um, Thank you. You've got a great AV team here. They're kind of fluid. I've noticed that things change on the screen. And uh, thank you guys for what you do back there. It's a kind of a just-in-time system we have here. Um, I bring greetings from my wife. Uh, she doesn't travel with me because I'm away most Sabbaths. And uh, from our daughter, she's a junior in academy. And our uh, son, he's down at Southern doing business. And so um, it's uh, having a, a family is a real blessing. But I bring greetings from my family. I have one wife, which means I have one mother-in-law. And uh, my mother-in-law lives in Moscow, Russia. And she's a wonderful lady, and those two facts are not related to the fact that she's so far away from me. So um, she once came to my house. This is a very painful memory. This is a trauma, right? She came to my house many, many years ago, and I was out for the day, and she rearranged all my books in my library in order of descending heights on the bookshelves. You know? And I, for months and months afterwards, I think, now, where's that book on Matthew? And it's just gone. I have to spend minutes and minutes searching for it. And... Um, my thoughts toward her were hardly Christian. For months afterwards, I was struggling to put my library back together. But anyway, I have one wife, and uh, that's a real blessing as well. So um, let's bow our heads and invite God's blessing upon us as we open the word of God together. Dear Lord, we know that Satan is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And so today, Father, we want to learn more about this battle that we are all engaged in. Lord, we're gathered here from every corner of the planet, but we have a common foe. We have a common enemy that is death. We have a common hope that is the second coming, and we share a common savior that is Jesus Christ. And so today, Father, as we learn about our foe, I pray that our love for our savior will grow deeper and our witness for him will burn brighter. Father, I ask that you still any spirit not of your kingdom that may be present here this morning. 
that you rebuke them and you drive them from this house of worship. I ask, Father, that your spirit, your Holy Spirit, will be the only spirit present within these four walls this morning. And for those watching online, Father, I pray that it be the Spirit's voice that they hear speaking. And Lord, as I speak today, may it be words from your throne of grace. I ask forgiveness for my sins, that I be a worthy vessel of this message. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, so um, we're going to start out... Um, uh, we're, go we're going to start out by talking about some key terminology. We're then going to look at kind of deliverance and demon activity in the Old Testament. We're then going to come through to the New Testament and the ministry of Jesus. Uh, we're then going to look in a bit more detail at the scripture reading we've just read. And then we're going to look at some personal application questions. So you kind of, that's the journey we're going to go on this morning. Um, I recognize that I do not speak with a Virginian accent. I apologize in advance if I'm hard to understand. Uh, my accent is the result of sanctification, so we'll all get there one day. <laughs> so, that's a joke, by the way. So, um, we're going to start out by some key New Testament terminology, all right? So, um, I, I will leave this. The PowerPoint is on your computer here, so if any of you want this PowerPoint later, you can collect it uh, from the church. Uh, so, we find in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, there is an interchangeable use of the, what we call demons in the modern world. We have unclean spirits. In Mark 1.23, we have demon, a daimonion in Mark 8.31, and Luke 8.11.24 talks about evil and evil, evil spirit. Now, the, the concept of possession per se doesn't appear an awful lot in the New Testament. What you have is, is the verb daimonizai, which is a passive verb, and it means to be demonized. But the extent of that demonization is left from story to story to, for us to figure out what is the extent of the demonization? How does it manifest itself in this person's life? Because as we're going to see, demonization takes place in different ways. Uh, the most common verb used in the uh, New Testament for, de for deliverance ministry, or um, we're not going to use the word exorcism, that's a Catholic phrase that has a whole baggage with it, but for deliverance is the word ekbalo. Now, balo means to throw, and ek is the preposition, it means out of. So the word exodus in the Bible, the second book of the Bible, is called exodus, which is not a Hebrew word at all, it's a Greek word. Ek means out of, hodos means word, and when you put ek and hodos together you get exodus, it means the road out. So um, that's the most common verb we find in the Gospels in particular, and it, also, it does also spill over into the book of Acts as well. Now when we look at the question of demons in the scripture, we find that they have the characteristics of personhood. Demons are not these kind of abstract forces out there. They have all of the characteristics of a human being. For instance, in Luke chapter 8, Jesus refers to them with personal pronouns. He says, you, plural. So, you know, we have I, you, he, she, it. And then in the plural, we have we, you, plural, and they. That's kind of how, how the pronouns work. Jesus refers to the demons using singular and personal second-person pronouns. He doesn't refer to them using the third-person neuter such as it, he refers to them as saying like you. So whenever Jesus speaks to a demon, he is speaking to you. He's giving it the characteristic of personhood. In Luke 11, which is the story of uh, the demoniac, Jesus speaks to the demon using a first person pronoun, that is you singular. In Matthew 8, verses 28 through 34, this is the story of the demoniacs on the eastern side of the Sea of Galilee. Um, in Matthew 8, there are two of them. In Mark 5, there's one of them. But in Matthew 8, we see that demons can speak through humans. We're going to see an example of that later in the scriptures, but demons can speak through humans. And so uh, in those cases, you find that the demon actually has control of that aspect of the human being. They can actually speak through you. We find in Matthew 12, 44, this is the passage which dis discusses where when a demon is cast out of somebody, it goes and wanders in waterless places. Remember that passage? And the owner of the house sweeps the house and leaves it nice and clean. But that's the problem, as I say to my wife on Thursday night when we hoover the house. A clean house is not a good thing, according to Matthew 12. The point about that passage, the point about that passage is that an empty house is not the house that God wants us to be. Because he's talking about a human being there. God wants us to be filled with the Holy Spirit. So we are not empty of any spirit, but we are filled with the Holy Spirit. And so the demon goes out... And when it, it finds nowhere to reside, because they like to dwell within a being, it comes back and it finds the house it was forced out of empty and swept and clean, 
this is a secular life. That I'm not going to have any relations with the spiritual. And so the demon inhabits that person. But what's more important is the demon says, I'm going to go and get seven more demons more wicked than itself. And they come back and reside in the individual. And that person's latter situation, says Jesus, is worse than their former situation. So how does this apply in ministry? There are many people in America today who believe that there's the kingdom of God, and they don't want anything to do with it. And those are the forces of Satan, and maybe they don't want to do anything with that either. They maybe played with the occult, they had a, played in a Ouija board, had their horoscope read, whatever the case may be. And they don't want anything to do with that, and they say, well, there's this middle neutral no man's ground. That's the secular life, and that's where I'm going to live. Free of moral responsibility, and free of, free of fear of the demons. But the truth of the gospel is there is no neutral middle ground. When somebody comes and says, I need help, if you say to them, yes, we can help you get free of this demonization today, uh, but do you want to become a disciple of Jesus Christ? Because if you resist the devil, he will flee from you. The next verse in, in German, James says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. So in turning away from Satan, we turn towards Jesus Christ in faith. And if somebody says, no, I, I want Jesus to set me free today, but I don't want to live the life of a disciple of Jesus Christ, ethically, as a minister of the gospel, you have a difficult decision to make. They're suffering today, that is no doubt. But if you ask Jesus to set them free and they're going to head off and live a secular life, you know that their latter condition will be worse than the former condition. So you have a responsibility to say to somebody, if you want to be set free from this kind of junk in your life, you need to become a disciple of Jesus Christ. All right, so um, they, they have a will, and they can make decisions, Matthew 12. James 2, you believe in God, says James. Congratulations, so do the demons, and they shudder. So Satan believes in God. In fact, Satan is um, a good Bible scholar. He knoweth that his time is short. He knows the prophecies. So don't think that it's just Adventists know the prophecies. So does Satan, so do the demons. They have an intellect in Mark 1.24. This is an interesting story. This is when a man with a spirit comes and sits in the synagogue in Capernaum and Jesus is preaching. It's, it's an astonishing story, isn't it? That this is a man with a spirit, an evil spirit, sitting in the Sabbath worship. He hears the praises of God. He hears the cantor lead out with the singing. He hears the, the reader read the Torah. He hears the prayers that are sent to Jehovah God. And he sits through the whole process without a, without a peep. If we think that people cannot bring demons into a church, let's, let's, let's look at the scriptures again. People can bring this trash with them into the church. Sometimes they don't even realize it. Now, in the second, third, and fourth centuries, when, when people came into the church, they were coming from a pagan background. They were worshipping idols, which are representations of demons. And so the church recognized that this was a problem. So when you became a Christian in the 2nd, 3rd, and 4th centuries, what would happen is you would join what was known as the catechumenate. That means you like Bible study lessons. You were prepared for baptism, and then you were baptized normally around Easter, and only then were you allowed to join the daily love feast. Now we have a quarterly Lord's Supper. But in those days, it was a daily love feast, where like a daily potluck. And so... And people would come into the church, but before they were baptized, there was a ritual deliverance. We find this in the writings of the church fathers, because people coming into the church bring their garbage with them. There are people who are baptized today on a diet of crowns and horns and dates and beasts, and 20 years later have still not gained victory over lust or fear or bitterness or rage or anger. And we wonder why there is dysfunctionality. And so they, they can sit in church, quite, quite comfortable to do that. And that demon confronted Jesus in church. What have, how to do, what have you to do with us, Jesus, son of the most high God, he said. Uh, they have an intellect, physical barriers. Physical barriers are no barriers to demonic travel. So you see stuff on Star Wars, like you go somewhere because you think you're there. That's kind of pretty much how demons operate as well. And we see that in Job 1, Satan comes into the presence of God. Now, we always say that sin cannot abide in the presence of God. That's a tough thing to sustain from Scripture, actually. That's a tough thing to sustain because Satan went into the heavenly councils and spoke with Jehovah God. Luke 11, 24 through 26, uh, they can communicate with each other. That's, um, they go and find other, other more wicked demons. And in Mark 5, verse 9, the story of the gathering demoniac, they're happy to reside in animals. 
So the conclusion of that is that demons have all the characteristics of personhood. They are smart beings. They're infinitely more powerful and intellectually stronger than any of us uh, sitting here today. Now turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 10. This, the text is not on the screen unless our just-in-time audiovisual team can manage that. But 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 20 and 21 there's a verse that we don't often dwell on, but I'm going to read it out here. 1 Corinthians 10, 20 through 21. And what it says there, uh, Paul is talking about warnings from Israel, Israel's history, and he's talking about the Lord's Supper, and he's talking to people in Corinth who are coming into the church from a pagan background, and they're bringing their spiritual junk with them. And the Apostle Paul says this. He says in verse 1 Corinthians 10, We'll pick it up actually verse 19. It says, What do I imply then? That food sacrificed to idols is anything or that an idol is anything? No, he says, verse 20, I imply that what pagans sacrifice, they sacrifice to what? To demons and not to God. I do not want you to be partners with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of of demons. And so Paul is dealing with an issue in a pagan society where people are offering food, they're buying food in the marketplace that's been offered to the idols before the animals were slaughtered. And so that food has been devoted to a demon. And then they come to the Lord's Supper and sometimes they're bringing that food with them because they'd have a common a love feast. So they're bringing food that's devoted to the worship of idols and now we're going to eat it in remembrance of the death of Jesus Christ. And there's a problem here. Now, you might say today that we're living in a pagan society, are we not? You can't look at the television these days without seeing occultic imagery absolutely everywhere. And our children are being raised drowning in a swamp of occultic imagery and, and themes. And I'm almost of the persuasion that we need to start thinking about doing a deliverance for everybody that comes into the Adventist church. Because people are bringing these pagan ideas and these godless demons into the body of Christ. I've, I don't know any of you here, here really from Adam or Eve. I'm not making any personal accusations here. But I've seen this enough in pastoral ministry to know that people are bringing the junk with them into the church. But in this passage here, it says that the, the idols, that when they bow down to the idols, they're bound down to demons. Is that clear? All right, so we're now going to look, look, go back to the Old Testament, and, if, and we're just going to look at a few texts here. But what was Israel's constant problem in the Old Testament? What was their number one problem? Idolatry. And we said idolatry is bowing down to what? Going bound to idols. They had statues of Dagon and Molech and Ashtoreth and so forth. But we've just learned in 1 Corinthians 10 that when the pagans bow down to these idols, what are they bowing down to? They're bound down to demons. Now it makes sense why God calls it spiritual what? Adultery. It's adultery. See, if my wife says to me, Conrad, I'm going to leave you. Why? I want to buy a Ferrari and I can't afford a Ferrari in you. Okay? That's one thing. Okay? If I lose my wife to a Ferrari, I hope that doesn't happen. But that's not as painful emotionally as my wife saying, Conrad, I'm going to leave you for another man. And so God is not so concerned about Israel bowing down to blocks of wood or blocks of silver or gold. He's, he's concerned about the adultery that this represents. That you are actually worshipping demons. And we know that by beholding you become changed. When you, when you fix your eyes on Jesus, you become like Jesus. When you start bowing down to demons and manifested in, in idols, you start to, uh, your character starts to exhibit the manifestations of those demons. Which is why idol worship inevitably leads to sexual immorality of the grossest form. Because it exacerbates the worst fallen desires in human beings. So, Deuteronomy 32. Um, we'll just look at a couple of these verses here. Deuteronomy 32. We'll take a look at that verse. Turn to it in your Bibles, if you will. Deuteronomy 32, verse 17. And it says there... This is the, uh, Moses speaking about the wandering in the wilderness. And it said, they, that is the Israelites, they sacrificed to what? Demons. Demons or devils, not to God, to deities they had never known. And he talks about the fact that they, look at verse 15, they scoffed at the rock of his salvation. Who is the rock of ages, the rock of salvation? Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians that rock was Christ. 
So they turned their back on Jesus, and in the wilderness they were worshipping gods, and it says demons that they'd never known before. So even as they were leaving Egypt, having just gone through the Exodus story and God's deliverance, God's people just couldn't let, get, let go of the worship of demons, because with demon worship allowed you to pursue the most sensual of desires. They were very sensual religions. Um, Psalm 106, 37, we'll take a look at that verse there. And uh, for those of you watching at home, please follow with your Bibles. But Psalm 106 and verse 37, it talks again about the Israelites in the wilderness. And what, what are they doing? Psalm 106, 37, it says, They sacrificed their sons and their daughters to the demons. They poured out innocent blood the blood of their sons and daughters whom they sacrificed to the idols of Canaan, and the land was polluted with blood. So they sacrificed to the idols of Canaan, says verse 38, but it's explained in verse 37, they're actually sacrificing to demons. It's kind of a sobering thought, isn't it? That God's people, God's visible people, were di directly and intentionally involved in demon worship. And so we go on, turn to Leviticus 17.7. 7. This kind of has a link with modern day Virginia. You ask me how, you'll see why in a minute. Leviticus 17 and verse 7. It says there, <clears throat> this is God um, speaking to, um, through Moses to Aaron and the priests. And God is setting up a new sacrificial system here that points forward to the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. There in John's Gospel. But why is God setting up this sacrificial? One of the reasons is there in Le Leviticus 17, 7. It says, so that they, that is the Israelites, may no longer offer their sacrifices for what? Yeah, my version says goat demons, which is about the most accurate translation you're going to get of the underlying Hebrew. They were worshipping goat demons. Now, if you ever go to a temple of Satan in Virginia, they'll have a statue of Satan, and what will it look like? It's a half man and a half goat. And they have various names. I won't mention them from the pulpit here. But if you go to a temple of Satan, they will have a manifestation of Satan, a, a statue, and it's a half goat and a half man. And we see those other texts there, um, Second Chronicles 11.15, we'll turn just to that one as well. Once again we find wor the worship of goat demons, which might be as associated directly with Satan himself. So Second Chronicles 11 and verse 15. Now, <clears throat> um, if, you, if you read your Bible through a few times, you will notice that um, Second Chronicles, let me just find it in my Bible here. You will notice that, um, that Chronicles tells the story of kings, does it not? So first and second kings is like the raw history. First and second chronicles is, is a commentary on the raw history. And from a Jewish perspective, this is called Midrash. Midrash is an ongoing commentary and it gives you the spiritual insight. So if you're gonna read a story in Kings, it's helpful to read the parallel in Chronicles because Chronicles will give you like the, the spiritual interpretation of what happened in Kings, all right? So the two books, the two first and second Kings go together with first and second chronicles. In fact, in the Russian Bible, it's all the same. It's 1st, 2nd, 3rd, 4th Kings. The Russian Bibles recognize that this is essentially the story and then the interpretation all together, okay? So 2nd uh, Chronicles 11 and verse 15 talks about Jeroboam. And Jeroboam splits the kingdom in half. He, when Solomon dies, Rehoboam, his son, says to the people of Israel, if my father scourged you with whips, I'll scourge you with scorpions. And so what happens is the northern ten tribes says, every man to his own tent, and what have we got to do with the house of Jesse? And so when Jeroboam goes north to stop the people coming down to Jerusalem to worship, he sets up um, statues in the north in Dan and in the south in Bethel, just north of Jerusalem, so that the people of Israel, the northern ten tribes, don't have to go to Jerusalem to worship. And what he does is, he says there in verse 15 of Second Chronicles 11, Jeroboam said he appointed his own priests for the high places, that's where the, the idol worship takes place, and for the goat demons, and for the calves that he had set up. And so when, when Jeroboam set up the worship of these golden calves, um, he, was, he was establishing demon worship as the worship, uh, the official religion of Israel. 
And it's not surprising that when you look at the stories of the kings of Israel from Jeroboam all the way through to the last king in 722 BC, when the Assyrians came, not one of them did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. Not one of them. Because they had committed their land ultimately to the worship of Satan. There was no good leader in that nation. Whereas Jerusalem, with the tribe of Judah and Benjamin, you had some kings who were good, like Hezekiah, and some kings who were wicked, such as Manasseh. There was a spiritual struggle going on within those nations. But the bottom line here is that when Israel was engaging in idolatry, they weren't just worshipping demons, but they were worshipping uh, Satan. But you find throughout Israel's history, and I've just given you some examples on the screen there, there are many examples of the, despite the fact that God warns his people repeatedly against doing this kind of thing, that God's people just couldn't get away from the occult. And there is a reason why that happens. And the basic reason why people are attracted to the occult is it gives you knowledge and power without moral responsibility for how you use it. That's the basic attraction of the occult. Knowledge and power without moral accountability for how you use that. You can use it for good. Some might call that white magic. You may use it for bad. That may be called black magic in some parts of the world. You, there are various manifestations of this, but um, whether, whatever form of magic people are practicing, is whatever, whatever kind of gloss we put on it, it's power and knowledge without moral accountability. And so people make a lot of money playing with the occult, reading horoscopes, drawing, reading people's palms, serving as a medium or in a, channel, a channeling, um, channeling spirits. We see throughout Israel's history, you see some examples on the screen there, Saul visited a medium just before his death. Manasseh, he made Jerusalem run, 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 run red with the blood of the prophets, including, we believe, the prophet Isaiah. Micah, God called a prophet to, to uh, rebuke his people for their fascination with the occult. That was before the, uh, the, uh, the exile. Uh, then in Leviticus 19, God gives explicit commands to his people to avoid witchcraft Saul engaged in sacrifices in 1 Samuel 15 that are condemned by Samuel. And in Isaiah 47, um, we, we see there, this isn't too much to do with Israel, but we see there that um, one of the sources of power of ancient Babylon was the sorceries that they practiced. That these, these ancient powers, whether it was Assyria, or whether it was Babylon, or whether it was Egypt, or whether it was Rome, these global superpowers had connections with the occult at the various highest levels. And so did Nancy Reagan, if we look at our own history. So we're not immune to this kind of thing here in the United States of America. That decisions get made on the basis of horoscopes. We bombed Libya because Nancy Reagan read a horoscope or something. So let's not think that this is ancient and primitive and superstitious. Real people died in the Middle East from American bombs because of the occult. If I'm offending anybody, I apologize, but it is the truth. So therefore we would say that these gods of the na surrounding nations that we find in the scriptures, such as Dagon, who was the god of the Philistines, um, Ashtoreth, who was a female deity, often used with, with a pole, that are like a totem pole. Um, she often went with Baal. Baal and Ashtoreth would mate, and then you'd have uh, fertile animals and fertile fields. And then you had Molech, he was the god of the Edomites and the Moabites on the eastern side of the Sea of Galilee. Um, they weren't just names of idols, they're actually the names of demons. Worshipped by God's people and by the surrounding nations. And um, as I said before, um, because demons are fallen, if you worship a fallen being, your character will start to reflect the character of the fallen being. And so if that is a demon that, that inspires, um, I don't know, alcohol or dependency, you will find yourself becoming alcoholic. If you find yourself worshipping on the altar of pornography, you will find your character will become out of control in sexual matters. By beholding, we become changed. So if there's something in your life today that you cannot give as a holy offering to a holy God, then go home today and clean it out of your house and clean it out of your life, and clean it out of your marriage. We're not coming here today to feel good. We're coming here today to draw closer to God. And to draw closer to God means we turn our backs on Satan in our homes, in our lives, in our attitudes, and the thoughts of our minds. 
So we don't have the Dagons and the Ashtoreths in our lives today, but we have plenty other gods in our Western society. And increasingly, we have overt pagan gods in our Western society. It's not just the god of, of Korea some, or the god of money. We also have more and more explicitly um, pagan gods entering our Western society. Some of those gods appear in our video games. You look at the names of the, of the characters, the avatars, and people say those names are from, are from spirits. We recognize those names. You may hear it in the music. The, the, uh, Alistair Crowley, who's a famous Satanist in Britain, whose basic motto was do as thou wilt. That motto, do as thou wilt, makes its way into many, many popular pop songs these days. The do as you want, that there is no law against anything. And the modern sexual revolution that's taking place around us, the basic rule of that is, it is forbidden to forbid. It is forbidden to forbid. And rather than worshipping the creator, we are now worshipping the creature. And because the creature is fallen, if you worship that which has fallen, you become ever more fallen yourself. Hence, you have a downward moral spiral within society. This is what's happening in our world today. So the tendency for the people of Israel to contact demons in the form of worship, child sacrifice, divination or sorcery, lasted from the Exodus, we've seen it in the book of Deuteronomy, all the way through to the Babylonian exile. And it only disappears from the Old Testament record when you come to the post-exilic prophets, when Zerubbabel went back from the Babylonian captivity and he took, what, 50-odd thousand Israelites with him. So from that time on, you don't see any evidence of it in Israelite society in the prophets, in the right Zechariah or Malachi or um, Zephaniah and so forth. But you see it earlier in the pre-exilic prophets. So when God sends his people away for 70 years, and it's 70 years because for 490 years they haven't obeyed the law of Jubilee, and let the land lie fallow. And so for 70 years, the land is allowed to lie fallow to catch up with things. So God sends them away for 70 years, and they get the message in a 70-year exile. Like sometimes God has to be radical with us to catch our attention. And the fact that things maybe appear to be going bad in your life doesn't mean that God has abandoned you. It may mean he's performing divine surgery on you. So I'm not a gardener. You know, I, we have a few acres at home, and my job is to chop the trees down and mow the lawn. Anything that requires brain, require, my wife does that, okay? So um, I've chopped down way too many flowers for my wife to let me anywhere near the flower beds right now. It's a painful story, actually. We won't delve into that today. Um, but I know this, that when, when my wife is, when I look at the roses, I look at them from like three or four feet away. I'm kind of like, oh, yeah, yeah, pretty, I guess so. But when my wife is pruning the flowers, you realize that the gardener is never closer to the rose than when the gardener is pruning the rose. Because you have to hold the rose delicately and snip and snip and snip. Likewise, the pruning process in our lives is an indication that God is very close to us. And it's not the sign of God's abandonment, it's the sign that God is at work in our lives in a profound way. So God gave repeated warnings against involvement with witchcraft. You got some examples, some text there on the screen. We won't dwell on those here this morning. And uh, whenever in the kingdom of Judah, a reforming king came to the throne, he would cleanse the nation. Now this is a big deal for us today, because if you look in the book of Acts, chapter 19, uh, when the gospel was preached in Ephesus, which was a center of um, pagan idol worship, when the people heard the gospel, what do they do to their books of magic? Yeah, they burned them, and they didn't burn them in their backyard. Where do they burn them? In the public square. This was a public rejection of the demons that the city was worshipping, the, 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 the patron saints of that city. If you go to Thailand today, you will see many cities have a central stupa. It's like a very, very tall like spire on a, on a, on a roundabout in the center of the city. Yeah, and tourists like to take pictures of these places. Those things are devoted to spirits. And oftentimes they will bury... Somebody who, was, who died in an awful way, like a murder victim, they'll bury that person under the stupa because then there's an angry spirit watching over that city. And so when I was chatting with some missionaries in Kong Khan, a big city in central Thailand, and they'd been there for three months, they were learning the Thai language, they learned it in about a year and a half, and by God's grace now there's some beautiful Thai congregations in that city. But uh, 12 years ago I was walking with them around the city, I said, you know, you're not going to face pushback from Satan in this city until you start the battle for souls. 
And you can live here learning the language like a tourist, like doing 40 hours of language learning a week. That's what you have to do as a missionary. But the moment you start engaging in evangelism, Satan's going to push back on your family. And he's going to push back on your kids. And your kids will bear the scars. And missionary kids do bear scars. All right? Some of them are physical. Very, very physical. One missionary from Benin, uh, he's, in, he's from Cote d'Ivoire, Pastor Michel Bardet, you see, maybe see him in our magazine. Uh, he spent, his older brother died when a demon attacked him, and, and he was called to minister him, but he couldn't do anything about it. He was at seminary in Cote d'Ivoire at the time, and he felt helpless in the face of this demonic power, so he's devoted the rest of his life to setting people free. And uh, he went to one city in Benin, which is the home of Voodoo, and he was chatting with his wife, and they had a two-year-old baby boy on her lap. And there was a big pot of water boiling in the kitchen. And, and, the, and he said, well, um, I reckon he was chatting with his wife about the reality of, of, of animism and witch doctors and spells and all the rest of it. And he said, well, he said, well, I'm glad that in our house the demons can't hurt us. At which point his son is lifted out of his wife's lap and is carried through the air to the pot of water and is dropped in the boiling water. And that boy, all the skin came off his left leg. And now if you see his leg... It's got, you know, discoloration. They had to do skin grafts, and it's a real mess. Satan attacks the bodies of your children because that's how he attacks you. And Satan attacks us because that's how he attacks God. He hurts God's children, which is why we're under satanic attack. But when you had reforming kings, they would cleanse the nation. So if you look at the stories of just Josiah and Hezekiah as good examples, when they came to the throne... They went through the whole land of Judah and they tore down the high places, they chopped down the groves, and they destroyed the altars and they got rid of the priests. Remember those stories? Okay, you should know your Bible histories. I hope you do well enough to know that. And they, they destroyed the physical evidence of demon worship within the land. It was a cleansing. And today, when somebody says, I need help, I may go with, I have a colleague in ministry in my office called Sister Susan Payne. We do a lot of this together. If somebody needs help, we may go to their house, and we have a couple of days praying and fasting, and we walk through the house, and we're looking for anything in the house that is an open doorway for Satan to enter that person's life. They went to Thailand as a tourist and came back with a statue of Buddha. They went to Haiti as an aid worker and came back with a wooden carved face mask. They went somewhere in Africa and came back with some kind of statuette. Things like that. Or they may have self-hypnosis CDs or self-help CDs. Uh, one guy I was ministering to was grossly overweight. He had these self-hypnosis CDs. So or he'd fall asleep and put the CD on and 15 minutes later it'd kick into action. And uh, it was basically putting messages into his brain. And a week after he started listening to these, he's standing in church and cursing Jesus Christ. Like, where did this come from? Well, we have to get rid of these things. We walk through the house. Look at your viewing history on the internet. What are you watching? Yeah. People don't want to give that up, I tell you. What are you watching? Because when you do these things, you're giving permission to Satan to play in your life. Whether you like it or not, whether you're aware of it or not, you are giving permission to Satan to play in your life. And so Judah had na national cleansings. And today as Adventists, we need to cleanse our homes. We need to purify our homes that everything that takes place there brings joy to the angels of God and brings delight to the Holy Spirit and does not cause the Holy Spirit to grieve. So again, we're having a wonderful day today here together by the grace of God, but go home and think about what I'm saying. And if the Holy Spirit is moving upon your heart and saying something needs to change when I get home, don't quench the Spirit, don't harden your heart, but go home and act on what the Spirit is convicting you of. So... We may say today, oh, God doesn't allow demons to attack God's children. Well, that's not true. The most famous example is Job. Yeah, we're all familiar with the story of Job. <clears throat> that's a story of what we call harassment. Job was never possessed. He was never oppressed, but he certainly faced harassment. That involved the death of his children and almost the breakup of his marriage and the loss of all of his property and all of his businesses. Job was reduced from being one of the wealthiest men of the Middle East to being pretty much one of the most miserable and poorest. And that was God allowing it to take place. Job didn't understand it at the time. He comes to understand later, I believe, but at the time he doesn't get it. So again, just because things are going well for you in life, financially, doesn't mean everything is right with God. Just because things are going bad in life, doesn't mean that God has abandoned you. 
what you see isn't necessarily the reality of what's going on behind the scenes. And so with Job, that's a classic case of harassment. Matthew 16, let's turn in your Bibles to that, Matthew 16. Uh, this is, uh, Jesus has been teaching, he's going to go to Jerusalem. He's going to be handed over to the chief priests. He's going to be killed. On the third day, he's going to rise from the dead again. And um, the, 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 te- the, the tense of the verb here in, in Mark, Matthew 16 and he does the same in Mark 9 and 10. The tense that is used by Matthew indicates that this is an ongoing teaching of Jesus, that Jesus didn't just preach this once, twice, or thrice. He was repeatedly telling the disciples, we're going to Jerusalem, I'm going to suffer, I'm going to die, but I'm going to rise again. Okay? And the disciples are worrying about who's the greatest in the kingdom of God, and God is worried about their salvation. Okay? And so Peter has had enough of this. Like, do you have to keep talking about this, Jesus? And so the text says, Peter, verse 22, took Jesus aside and began to what? What does your Bible say? Rebuke. Rebuke. Now that verb rebuke, it almost exclusively appears in the New Testament where Jesus is rebuking a spirit. So when Peter rebukes Jesus, the implication is Peter thinks that Jesus is operating under demonic influence here. And Jesus turns to Peter and he says, get thee behind me, who? Amen. Satan. Like, it's not me acting under satanic influence, Peter. It's you. Now, does Peter think that he's acting under satanic influence? Yes or no? Yeah. No. Does he think that he's offering good advice to Jesus? That you don't need to go to Jerusalem diet? Yes. But Peter is contradicting the plain words of Jesus Christ here. And so what we find there is that when a disciple today contradicts the plain teachings of Jesus, you're actually allowing Satan to speak through you at that moment. You may not realize it, you may not want it, you may not think about it in those terms, but when Jesus said to love your enemies and you say to kill your enemies, you are acting under satanic influence. When Jesus says to forgive those who've hurt you, pray for those who despitefully um, use you, bless those who persecute you, and you say, no, 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 that was back then, but not today. You're allowing yourself to come under satanic influence at that moment. Which is why in James 3, those who presume to teach, like the pastor or our Sabbath school teachers, are judged more harshly. We have a spiritual responsibility to seek and speak the truth. Because truth matters. And you can preach a sermon or teach a Sabbath school lesson and plant an idea that stays with someone for the rest of their life. So the truth matters and the words we speak matter. And when we willfully, knowingly, deliberately go against the plain teachings of Jesus, we are allowing Satan to take control of those faculties of our mind. That is what we call oppression. Then you have John, so you have Judas. You turn to John 6. Now, John's gospel doesn't have Jesus eating the bread and drinking the wine in the Lord's Supper. You get that in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. What we do have is the discussion about eating my flesh and drinking my blood in John 6. And a lot of his followers were upset by these teachings of Jesus because it sounds suspiciously like cannibalism. And so many of his followers leave him. And Jesus says to the twelve, in verse John 6 and verse 67, Jesus asked the twelve, do you also wish to go away? Now Jesus knows what it is to face rejection. And Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom can we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. And Jesus answered them, Did I not choose you, the twelve, yet one of you is a what? Devil. The word is dia- diabolos. There's a, a frari called the diabolos, yes? There's a, yes, the devil, yeah? You're nodding, brother, yeah? You know your supercars. There's also um, a Lamborghini called the um, Testarossa. Uh, that's designed for men. I'm looking forward to the estrogena for women, but they haven't yet brought that out. But Jesus says to the twelve, one of you is a diabolos. He was speaking of Judas, son of Simon, Is- Simon Iscariot, for though he, though one of the twelve, was going to betray him. Now, this is at the start of his ministry. If you think of the twelve, who's the logical treasurer for the disciples? Who's the logical treasurer? Sorry? Matthew. Yeah, and why are you saying Matthew, sister? He was a tax collector. Yeah, he worked for the IRS. Okay? He's supposed to know something about money, yes? And not only does he work for the IRS, but he takes a little bit extra and puts it in his pocket on every transaction, yes? That's how they made their living. That's what Zach- um, Zacchaeus did in, in uh, Luke 19 there. You know, everybody that I defraud, I take extra money from. So 
The logical person to manage the disciples' common purse was Matthew, but they gave the job to Judas. He was the conference treasurer, and he had a demon. Now, don't quote me on that. But he was the conference treasurer, and he had a demon. And notice this, for three and a half years, with those disciples arguing all the time about who was the greatest in the kingdom of God and jockeying for position, nobody suspected Judas of the embezzlement that was going on. Because we know later in this gospel, John 13, that John, when he complained about that money could have been given to the poor, that the woman spent on the, the ointment to pour on Jesus' feet, the text says, but he was stealing from the common purse. And nobody picked it up in three and a half years. This guy is smart with money. And he was the conference treasurer, and he had a demon. And at the end of his life, in uh, John 13, Jesus says to Pete, to Judas, so go and do what you're going to do. And Judas leaves to go and get the soldiers to pick Jesus up in the Garden of Gethsemane. And it says in that chapter there, and Satan entered into him. It's the only verse in the New Testament that says Satan entered into a human being. Satan entered into Judas because he was wholeheartedly resolved to doing things his way and not God's way. And you might say that later that day, that was Thursday, that was Thursday night, wasn't it? Friday morning, both Jesus and Judas hung on a tree outside the walls of Jerusalem. Judas died for love of money, and Jesus died for love of you and me. They both hung on a tree. One for love of you and me, the other for love of money. So Judas had possession. The other example we'll look at is 2 Corinthians 12. So turn your Bibles there. And um, <clears throat> 2 Corinthians 12. And the Apostle Paul talks there about um, an ecstatic experience that he's engaged in. Now we tend to think of the Apostle Paul as being a dry theologian, but he was anything but that. See, the Jews believed that there were seven heavens. You heard of the expression, the seventh heaven? The Jews believed there were seven heavens, and God dwelt in the seventh heaven, and some demons from prison in some of the lower heavens, and God's storehouses of, of snow and hail and ice was kept in some of the other heavens. And they also believed that in order to get into the presence of God, there were seven gateways. Between each level of heaven, there was a gateway with two angels guarding it. And to get into the seventh level, you had to have a scroll with seven seals on it. Does any of this ring a bell to us as Adventists? A scroll with seven seals. And you, uh, you broke each seal, and you went on this ecstatic trip. You took some, like, LSD or the equivalent thereof. I'm not recommending it today, but when the Beatles went to India, they took LSD. It wasn't because they wanted a high. It's because they were trying to meet with spirit beings. Okay? Lucy in the Sky of Diamonds, all that kind of stuff. So... Um, they will break a seal and there will be a password and they exchange it with the angels they get into the next level of heaven it's called Merkava mysticism a Merkava is Hebrew, it means a fiery chariot Elijah went to heaven on a, on a Merkava a fiery chariot so this is the chariot into heaven and um, so Paul talks autobiographically about I know a person in Christ who was caught up 14 years ago into the what? the third heaven there are documented trips of rabbis that made these trips some of them came back and died some of them came back and went crazy. Some of them came back and committed suicide. Very few of them came back from such a trip and actually stayed sane and functional as a rabbi. These are documented cases in history. But the Apostle Paul says, I was caught up into the third heaven, and basically he says, God revealed things to me that no mortal should ever be permitted to see or hear or know. And so he comes, he's engaged in his ministry, and the question is, in whose strength is Paul going to minister? Because Paul was a brilliant scholar, he had a world-class education with Gamaliel II, a very famous rabbi. Um, he comes from the tribe of Benjamin. He was circumcised on the eighth day. He was zealous for the traditions of the Jews more than all the other people his age. This guy was the rising star of Judaism. But when he becomes an apostle, the question is, will he minister in his own strength? Will he minister on the basis of his brilliant education? Will he minister on the strength of the fact that he can write like nobody else? And so the text says, in verse 7... Therefore, to keep me from being too elated or proud, a what was given me in the flesh? A thorn. A messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from being too elated or proud. Three times I appealed to the Lord about this, that it would leave me, but he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Now we ask ourselves, what was that thorn in the flesh? 
Some people say he had bad eyesight. Well, true, because oftentimes Paul finishes one of his epistles and say, I, Paul, write this reading with my own hand. We know he had a secretary that actually wrote, he would, he would dictate and somebody would write. We also know from the church of Corinth that Paul could write really great letters, but he was a terrible preacher. Like they'd rather listen to the super apostle Apollos than Paul any day. Right? You're no Mark Finley, Paul. Okay? But there are these are speculations, but what does the text say? Let's, let's apply an Adventist hermeneutic. What's the literal phrase that Paul uses? A thorn was given me in the flesh, then what does it say? To torment me. And that word messenger in the underlying Greek is angelos, which is the word angel. That's why the three angels of Revelation 14 can be angeloi, it can be messenger or angel. The, the, me, the message of the seven churches, the, the angels of the seven churches, are messengers. But Paul says that God allowed an angel of Satan to torment him. That's the literal translation there. And so God is saying to Paul, you may have a brilliant education, and you may be the most Jewish of all the Jews out there, and you may have a brilliant mind, and I may have given you revelations in the third heaven. Like you have, you are the, you have everything going for you as an apostle, but to stop you from being too proud and ministering in your own strength, I'm going to allow a demon to torment you because that's going to teach you to become a dependent upon me. I'm going to allow you to realize that this is not a battle of logic or a battle of brilliant ideas. It's a battle of life and death between spiritual beings. Well, I'm going to allow an angel of Satan to torment you so that you learn that when you are weak, then God is going to be strong through you. And so we don't think of these characters in the Bible as experiencing demonizations. When Paul says in 2 Timothy of chapter 5, I have fought the good fight. I have kept the faith. I finished the race. From now on there awaits me a crown of righteousness and so forth. He's not just talking about, you know, I fought on church board meetings. Some people have. And you wonder what kind of voice is speaking sometimes. I haven't just fought against men. I haven't just fought in Ephesus against animals. I know what it is to fight with the forces of evil. And by God's grace, I've gained the victory through my dependence upon Jesus Christ. And so these are characters in the Bible who experience demonic attack. You have Paul and Job experience harassment. Peter experiences what we call oppression. That's where you allow Satan to take control of an aspect of your life. Judas, one of the 12, experiences full-on possession. So, coming to the story of Jesus, and we're going to have to speed up here a bit, I suspect. The Gospel talks about, if you look at the Gospels, the synoptics, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they have these summary statements. And you find them repeatedly through the synoptics. The, the word synoptic means that they see the Gospel through the same set of eyes. So, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the underlying Greek is about 70% word for word the same. That's why it's called synoptic, like they're telling the same story. John is completely different. But the synoptics, sun means together, like synergy, you work together. Optic, optare is the verb to see in Latin. So it's a combination of two different languages, Greek and Latin. But synoptic means that they see the life of Jesus from the same set of eyes. And um, in the synoptic gospels, you get these summaries that basically say, Jesus went throughout the towns of Galilee, healing the sick, preaching the gospel, and cleansing the lepers, raising the dead, and casting demons out. That's a basic summary statement. You see it repeatedly through the synoptics. And it's a summary of what Jesus did. And then you see that in Mark chapter 3, after the showdown in the wilderness with Satan in the beginning of Matthew's gospel, the, the, the disciples, or the, the Sadducees and the Pharisees are saying to Jesus, it is by the power of Beelzebub that you're casting out spirits. And Jesus says, well, a house divided cannot stand. And then he explains, he says, you cannot enter a strong man's house and, and plunder his goods unless first you do what? You... You bind or you tie up the strong man. And Jesus bound up the strong man in the, in the showdown in the wilderness. And from that moment on, he could go around. And because he bound up Satan in the wilderness and defeated him, therefore Jesus could go and set Satan's captives free through the rest of the Gospels. So you might say that Jesus defeated sin on Calvary, but he defeated Satan in the showdown in the wilderness there in Matthew chapter 4. And so then the Gospels, the synoptics, give us seven specific stories about Jesus setting people free. And we're not going to go through these in any great detail, just briefly mention these. You're familiar with these stories, but those are the seven stories. Uh, there's the Sabbath worship of the man in the synagogue 
who listens to the preaching and he's in front of Jesus and it doesn't trouble him at all. And you wonder, why is that possible? Well, people who, who, who've played in the occult will tell you that some demons are more wicked than others. Like some have been more in the courts of heaven than others. They, use, they, they become immunized to the praise of God. They can sit in a church and listen to Hark for, or, or hail the power of Jesus' name. It doesn't worry them at all because they've been listening to this for eons and eons and eons in heaven. So they're not really worried about that. You've got the deaf and the dumb demoniac. This is an interesting case because oftentimes people present with a physical problem. The doctor will say this is a physical problem. But oftentimes there's a spiritual cause underlying it. Not always. And so that's where you need the gift of discernment. 1 Corinthians 10 or 12, 10 says that one of the gifts God gives to the church is the discernment of spirits. To know what's genuine mental health, what's physical health, and what's the case of demonization. It's not always obvious. The Gadarene demoniac, the story of the pigs. The Syrophoenician daughter, Mark 7, who pleads for a daughter. And she yes, but even the dogs eat the scraps on the floor, she says. And she exhibits faith. The epileptic boy of Matthew 17, the bound woman of Luke 13, and the demoniac of Matthew 9. A few things we see here. One is that Jesus never, never cast a demon out of somebody who didn't ask for help. Like, Jesus never cured Judas. There was no record of Judas ever asking for help. Whereas you see in the story of the epileptic boy in Matthew 17, that's when Jesus comes down from the Mount of Transfiguration, and the disciples can't cast out a demon, and the father describes what modern-day doctors would say grand mal epilepsy was going on. The boy has these seizures, and it throws him to the ground, and so forth. And Jesus treats it as demonization, not as epilepsy. In that case there, we see, and we see it in our ministry in AFM, that um, God needs permission to act in somebody's life that God honors your free will. And if through your free will choice of sin, you've allowed Satan into your life, God is not gonna force himself on you to set you free. You need to ask for help. Like the demoniac ran to the feet of Jesus and he bowed down at the feet of Jesus. And when he spoke, it was the demons that spoke, but the very fact that he ran and bowed before Jesus was enough to tell Jesus that this man wants help. And in the story of the, the Syrophoenician daughter and the epileptic boy, we see that parents have the right to bring before God their children and ask for help. The, the power of intercessory prayer. Parents, you have a right, in fact, a responsibility to ask God to set your children free from the attacks of Satan. Because they may not understand it in those terms yet, but Jesus set those children free. So, the arrival of the kingdom of God at the start of Mark's gospel, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. And in John's gospel, that's what John preached in John 1, meant that the strong man, Satan, had been bound up in the showdown in the wilderness. And now Jesus could go around setting Satan's captives free. And I say amen to that. Because when you meet people who are experiencing demonization, it is degrading and it is dehumanizing and it destroys their personhood as an individual. Satan wants nothing more, not just to destroy you, but to take you down in a painful humiliating way that strips you of your dignity that strips you of the image of God that strips you of your of your um, the inherent dignity of being a child and created in God's image so uh, Jesus we'll move on from this Matthew 6 13 come to the Lord's Prayer now, I'm moving fast here because I'm looking at the time back here and thinking how much longer do we have here so um, anyway my wife says, if you ask me a question, I'll talk for an hour. So that's a problem I have, all right? <clears throat> so anyway, Matthew 6, verse 13, Jesus teaches us in the Lord's Prayer to say, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. But that's not what he says. Literally, he says, apotu poneru, which means in the Greek, which means from the evil one. So Jesus doesn't say, deliver us from evil like rain on my wedding day or April 15 tax day. Okay? That's not the evil that Jesus is talking about. Jesus is saying we are to ask our Heavenly Father for deliverance from the attacks of the evil one. Now, how often are we to pray this? Well, the previous verse says, give us this day our what? So do you want to eat your bread on a daily basis? So how often should we be praying the Lord's Prayer, the model prayer? Every single day. Really? I mean, Muslims pray their rakas. They'll pray the first surah of the Quran 17 times in a day, a devout Muslim. So I don't see a problem with us as Christians praying the Lord's Prayer on a daily basis. Make it part of your spiritual life because it covers all your needs for the day. 
And so if we ask God for daily bread on a daily basis, by implication, we ask God on a daily basis for deliverance from the attacks of Satan. Which means, if Jesus says, you need to ask your Heavenly Father on a daily basis for deliverance from the attacks of Satan, it means you are under attack under a daily basis by Satan. You may not realize it. Your eyes may not be open to that. But things are happening in your life, in your family, in your marriage, in your heart, that reflect Satan's temptations. And every temptation is built on a falsehood. The basic premise of every temptation is this. If you do this, it will be good for you in this way. That's the basic premise of every temptation, and it's a lie. Therefore, we respond to the temptations of Satan, not with the power of God, but with the truth of God. We find that in the Word of God. We'll come to that in a minute. But Jesus gave authority to the twelve, and then to the seventy. He gave them explicit permission to cast out spirits. Now, as Adventists, Jesus had three components of his ministry. There was preaching, teaching, and healing. And uh, preaching and teaching, that's so sorry. Preaching, healing, and deliverance were the three aspects of Jesus' ministry. We like to preach. We have a health message, but we never talk about the third component. We never talk about it. But we have, we're, we're here from all parts of the world. It's a beautiful congregation here today. This is how it should be. God's people should be drawn from every nation, tribe, language, and people. So celebrate what we have here today, because this is a rebuke to the world and the division of the world, that we can be brothers and sisters in Christ. But as we come together from different parts of the world, we come from different cultural backgrounds which see God working in different ways and Satan working in different ways. And so different parts of the congregation are more aware of these things than others. I won't go into any more detail from the pulpit, but that's true. And so Jesus commissioned the 12 and the 70 to a ministry of preaching, healing, and deliverance. And he never rescinded those, te- those commands. And those gifts of the casting out of spirits, Jesus says that will continue till his second coming. Mark 16, 17 says, These signs, that is the casting out of spirits, will accompany those who believe. By using my name, they will cast out demons, and they will speak in new tongues. And so, um, I'm not going to dwell on tongues here today, but the casting out of demons is a gift that God gives his church, just like the spirit of prophecy, from the time of his ascension to heaven till the second coming of Jesus. And if we say that's not true, then you're denying the plain teaching of Jesus, and you're allowing Satan to act through you. Because once Christians view Satan as like a fairy tale figure, just a little figure with a pitchfork like you see in cartoons, we start to we lose sight of how serious temptation is and how serious sin is. And sin keeps us out of the promised land. It was one sin took Adam and Eve out of Eden. It was one sin kept Moses out of the promised land. We need to realize how serious sin is. And when we say that Satan isn't such a big deal and demons aren't such a big deal, you know, when you think that your, your enemy really isn't as powerful as they really are, when you underestimate your enemy, you're heading for a fall one way or another so in brief here in the apostolic era we have the lord's prayer Uh, look at um you can get this powerpoint later from the audiovisual team when philip preached in samaria he was philip the evangelist and he did three things he preached he healed and he cast out demons and then he baptized but he only baptized after the demons were cast out which is what the early church did for the next 300 years and then when paganism overwhelmed the church the church saw no need to cast out demons. We're quite welcome. They're quite welcome in the church anyway, in the Dark Ages. You have the church ministry of Jerusalem. You have the possessed girl in Acts 16 in Philippi who follows um, Paul. She's a slave girl, yes? But she's a slave not just to her earthly masters. She's a slave to the spirit world. She is in double bondage. And Paul turns, and it doesn't say what she does. He says to her owners, like set her free. But he sets her free from the most serious bondage, which is bondage to the spirit world. Then you have the seven sons of Sceva, who use the name of Jesus in a magical way. And we need to avoid this way of thinking. So magical thinking says this. God is like a heavenly jukebox. If I put in one dollar, I'm going to get a candy candy bar out. So if I pray in a certain way, God must respond in a certain way. That's magical thinking. But when Elijah fled back to Mount Sinai, in 1 Kings 18 and 19, he goes back there, and he goes back to the cave. It says the cave in the Hebrew, but that's where Moses was hidden by God in Exodus 34, when he asked God to show him his glory. 
But God was not in the wind, and God was not in the storm, and God was not in the fire. God actually appeared in a still, small voice. And the point about that is Elijah went back to where God had last revealed himself and expecting God to show up in a certain way. And God is sovereign. He doesn't do that all the time. So the seven sons of Sceva had a magical worldview. And thought, we need to avoid that today. If I only pray in a certain way, God is on a bound to do certain things for me. It doesn't work like that. Then you have the armor of God. We won't say much about that. I'm not saying much about anything today, actually, are we, when I think about it. But the armor of God, you have the shield of faith and the helmets of of righteousness, the helmets of salvation, the breastplates of righteousness, and the belts of truth, and the feet are shod with your willingness to share the gospel. And you have the sword of the spirit, is the word of God. And um, it's a kind of a Greek lesson this morning, but Paul does not use the most famous word for word in Greek. The most famous word for word in Greek is logos. Have you heard logos? Logos in the beginning was the logos, and the logos was with God, and the logos was God. Logos means word. But it means the, the expression of. So Jesus in the beginning was the expression of God. And the, the expression of God was with God and the expression of God was God. So just as my words are a reflection of who I am. So Jesus is a reflection of his father. He's the perfect imprint. Like we read in Hebrews 1, 1 through 4. We just done in our Sabbath school lessons. And so that word logos is used all the way through the New Testament. And we might say that Jesus is the incarnate word. This is the printed word. And the sermon is the spoken word. But the spoken word and the printed word point to the incarnate word. That's the point of preaching. Okay? But Paul does not use the word logos in the sword of the spirit is the word of God. He uses another word. He uses the word rhema, which means the spoken utterance of the word. Why is that important? When Satan tempted Jesus, how did Jesus respond? It is written. He quoted the word of God back. Now, we live in a world where no matter how long you've walked with Jesus Christ, you're still a fallen human being. And you cannot get something 100% true out of something that is 100% flawed. The only thing that I have in my life that I know of that is 100% true is the word of God. And if Satan puts a lie into your life, we respond to the lies of Satan, his temptations, by quoting the word of God back to him. If we debate him, he's going to convince you otherwise. You can't fight Satan with your mind, but you can rebuke him with the word of God. Because that is the only truth, the only absolutely true thing you have in your home, in your heart, is the word of God. And so that's why it's incumbent upon us to start memorizing passages. When Satan says, as an example, God could never forgive you for that sin. You can quote back, no, it is written, if I confess my sin, which I have done, he who is faithful and just will forgive me and cleanse me of my, of my unrighteousness, and he has done that. And so qu quoting back to Satan the promises of God turns Satan around. It drives him away from us. And then you have, that's why in deliverance ministry or in our lives, and when temptation comes our way, quote scripture when temptation comes into your mind. And learn scriptures that relate to your most common temptations. Like, I've never touched alcohol in my life, so I can walk by a bar and I have no temptation. Like, I go through the airport at O'Hare, and they're selling alcohol there. I have as much interest in that as eating fried snails. I mean, really, I have no interest. Okay. Je ne suis, je ne suis, je ne suis français, pas, oui. I'm not French, that's why I'm English. The French call the English les roast beef, the roast beef eaters, and the French call the English call the French the frogs, old term, derogatory terms from the Middle Ages. But uh, as an Englishman, I'm not attracted to frogs, so I have no attraction to it. I have no attraction to alcohol. But somebody else may have had an alcoholic father. They may have been given alcohol as a kid. They may have drunk themselves witless in university or college. And now they have a weakness for this. And Satan knows which buttons to press. He knows your buttons because he studied you. He knows your past. He knows your pain. He knows your preferences. He knows where you're going to fall. And so that's why if I walk by a bar, I'm not going to look in. But an alcoholic who walks by a bar in O'Hare Airport, he's going to feel this draw, it's like this magnetic pull. And so he may need to walk on the other side of the corridor and look the other way. So when those times of temptation come, if you know that you have a weakness for A, B, or C, Learn scriptural promises relating to A, B, and C and the victory that God gives in those areas. If your struggle is with anger, learn the promises dealing with anger and forgiveness. 
If your struggle is with love or lust, study the promises concerning purity. That I, the Lord, I am holy. Be thou holy. And so forth. Learn the passages that relate to your weakness. Because you know what your weaknesses are. And when Satan tempts you with your weakness, you quote those, those verses back at him. And Satan will turn around and go away. Because he cannot fight against the word of God. The word of God is an expression of who God is. He cannot fight God personally. So we're going to look, as we're coming close to an end here. One verse, this is our scripture reading. <clears throat> a very famous verse. I'll put it up in two versions there on the screen. I'll read it first in the King James. And uh, thank you, young man, for reading the scripture today. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in the high places. The New Revised puts it this way, for our struggle is not against enemies of blood and flesh, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of the present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Now, we're familiar with this verse, yes? Now, I've highlighted two words in red, rulers and authorities. And Paul here is talking, he uses these words throughout the New Testament to refer to fallen angels, rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. Arche is the word for ruler. Arche, we get the word archbishop. Arch, A-R-C-H, like the archbishop. Um, the come from the Greek word arche, it means head. So it, I have a head, this is my arche. Um, if you are the headwaters of the Nile or the headwaters of the Mississippi, that's the source of the Mississippi or the source of the Nile, that's the use of the word head. And it also means rulership and authority. And so the rulership, these rulers and these authorities that have authority over fallen human beings, that's who our struggle is against. It's neither Republican or Democrat, red or blue. Our struggle is ultimately against Satan and his minions. Because no matter which way you vote, that doesn't guarantee you heaven, doesn't give you heaven at all, no matter what the politicians may promise. We want eternal life, and therefore we need to take care of the biggest issue in our life, which is the fact that Satan is attacking us. So how does Paul use these two words? So there, I've put an interlinear up view there. And um, it's all got messed up because it was in the uh, Koine Greek this morning. But anyway, I, I put an interlinear. So there's the Greek is the gobbledygook. And then underneath it, you have literal word for word translation. So it's against the heads and against the authorities. So um, we're going to look at those two words uh, just for a few verses. How does the Apostle Paul use these words? Firstly, he uses them in Colossians 1.16. He says, For in him, that is in Christ, all things in heaven and earth were created, things visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers, archaes and exousias, that is, fallen angels, all things have been created through him and for him. What that teaches us is that Jesus Christ, as the creator, created all spiritual beings, all angels. He, uh, he is the creator of all angels, including those who today are unfallen and those who are fallen. That makes sense? First Peter. Peter says this when he's talking about Jesus ascending into heaven at his ascension. He says, Jesus has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels. And then it says, so the angels are with God. And then it says, authorities and powers made subject to him. That's a dependent clause there. The authorities and the powers are the fallen beings. So Jesus is enthroned in heaven with the unfallen angels. But the fallen angels have been made subject to Jesus Christ. And you can say amen to that, can't you? That they do have a boss. Now, you may be attacked by a dog in the park called Charlie, and you may be fighting or kicking that dog up, but when somebody shouts, Charlie, come here, you're jolly grateful that dog has a boss, yes? That dog tells that, the master tells the dog to lay off you. So at his ascension into heaven, Jesus um, has authority over all angelic beings. And that is really good news for us today. Ephesians 1, 21, before Paul talks about spiritual warfare, he says, Jesus is now seated at the right hand of Jesus and he's other, for his Father in heaven. And he says that Jesus is far above all rule and authority. It's the same words, arche and exousia, and power and dominion, above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. So Jesus is far above all angelic beings. And how do we live our lives today? Ephesians 3 tells us this way. It is that through the, the church, that is the Chesapeake Seventh-day Adventist Church, the wisdom of God, that is the plan of salvation, the wisdom of God or the mystery of God or the plan of salvation, 
The wisdom of God in its rich variety might now be made known to the who? The rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. That is, our lives are a witness not just to our neighbors and to our family members, but our lives are a witness to the unfallen worlds and to the fallen beings of what it means to be a born-again disciple of Jesus Christ. That your life is lived before angels. Angels are watching you. Daniel 5 talks about the heavenly watchers. You have guardian angels and you have fallen angels watching you to see how they can make you stumble. Your life is not insignificant. How you live your life today, how you gain victory over sin, how you resist temptation is muttered about by the fallen angels and celebrated by the unfallen angels. And over every sinner that turns to God, there is rejoicing in heaven. That is, your life has a cosmic significance when we realize that fallen angels are watching you, but your life and the, the, us as a church body here together, when we come together in unity and when we can forgive one another and we can live and work with one another, that is a testament to the fallen angels that the power of God is real and it can transform fallen human beings. So when you face division in your church, don't say, I'm right and you're wrong. Say, how can we rebuke the spirits and the fallen angels and how can we bring glory to God in this situation and if I need to say I'm sorry and if I need to give way on my views today so be it but it's better that we have a united front against the forces of Satan than I stand on being right and you're right and we never talk to each other again and then when the end comes the second coming then comes the end when the hands when he that is God sorry Jesus hands a kingdom over the, hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed every ruler and authority and power. That means, as Paul says, that every fallen angel is going to be destroyed. Amen. Amen, amen and amen. amen. And that's why the demons said to Jesus, have you come to torment us before the appointed time? Uh, they know their end is short, and we need to hear that their end is short because they're the source of all human misery and suffering. And so at his second coming, or after his second coming, Jesus will not just destroy the wicked, but he will destroy the source of evil, which is Satan and his fallen angels. And part of the good news of salvation is that Satan will burn, baby burn, in that lake of fire. Now, we don't talk about the lake of fire much these days, but he will burn in that lake of fire. He will be forever destroyed, no more to torment you or me. That is part of the good news. It's not just the arrival of the kingdom of God, it's the destruction of the kingdom of Satan. It is wonderful, wonderful news. And so we can go around with a smile on our faces knowing that, yeah, those that are attacking me today, those that are tormenting me today, those that are tempting me today, I know their ultimate destiny. And then finally there, for I am convinced, says Paul, that neither death nor life, nor angels, those are unfallen angels, nor rulers, those are fallen angels, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, who goes on to say, will separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Well, that tells you is that God's love is sticky. No matter what Satan may do to you, no matter how hard he may hit you, no matter, no matter how fought low you may fall, God's love is going to stick to you. That Satan cannot peel you away from God's love. That no matter how much Satan has his grip in you or in your children, God's love still applies to you and to your children. God doesn't treat you any differently or look you look you in any bad way simply because Satan's got his teeth into you. No, nothing can separate disciples of Jesus Christ from the love of God, no matter what Satan may try and do. Isn't that good news? It's wonderful news. So in practical terms, and this is our last slide, I know that our, our potluck is probably burning in there. So we do have to bring this to a close here, all right? So in practical terms, what's your takeaway today? Firstly, start praying the Lord's Prayer on a daily basis. And understand that you're asking your Heavenly Father for deliverance from the attacks of the evil one. You are under attack. If you're not aware of it before, you are aware of it now. And understand that things happen in your life that are bad, often because Satan's trying to discourage you or destroy your faith. So pray for deliverance from the attacks of the evil one. Secondly, if you want to get rid of rats in your, gar in your basement, you don't kill the rats, you clean out the garbage. Because the rats feed where the garbage is. Bitterness and pain from the past, lack of forgiveness, lust and pain and anger and fear and anxiety. This is garbage. And that's where the rats will feed. They will play on those things and they will bring profound pain into your life. So the best way to get rid of the rats is to clean out the garbage. That means repentance. It means confession. It means working for reconciliation with those who've hurt you. Forgiving those who've hurt you in your past and working for a restored relationship. 
It means if the Spirit has convicted you today of a sin in your life that needs taken care of, a prejudice, a bigotry, a, um, an embezzlement like Judas, um, teaching against the words of Jesus like Peter, being proud maybe like Paul, then deal with it today. Go home, get on your knees and confess before your Heavenly Father. Again, we're not coming to church for a feel-good sermon. We're in a battle of life and death and eternity's on the line. And do not trade away your eternity because you cherish that feeling of hatred towards your father or your mother. It's not worth it. Sorry. <coughs> we don't go looking for trouble as Adventists. <coughs> I swallowed some water. But neither are we running from trouble. <coughs> and finally, put on the armor of God and stand firm and see the victory that God can work for you in your life. <coughs> Thank you, brother. Thank you. <coughs> Sorry. What a moment to hit, yes? <coughs> I wasn't getting emotional, I just couldn't breathe. <coughs> it's like COVID in the pulpit. So, <coughs> put on the armor of God. <coughs> put on the shield of faith. Put on yourself the breastplate of righteousness. Seek to be a pure and a holy being. Put on your mind the helmet of salvation. Have the assurance of salvation. Know that you are a born-again child of Jesus Christ. And that you can know that you have the assurance of salvation. We read in the epistles of John. Put on your feet the willingness to share the gospel. To tell people what God has done for you. And carry the sword of the Spirit in your pocket. If you can't memorize scripture, carry it printed out. Carry some key verses. When Satan tempts you in your area of weakness... Be prepared and quote the word of God back at him, and he will flee. We are in a battle, but Jesus has never lost a battle with Satan. He beat him in heaven. He beat him in the wilderness. He beat him in Gethsemane. He conquered him on that resurrection Sunday, and he's coming again. And he's coming again to save those who are waiting for him. So be strong and be of good courage. The battle belongs to the Lord. Let him fight the battles for you. Amen.